Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he should eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city, who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had bidden him saw it, he spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors, and one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. So it's a 10 to 1 ratio, you see it. If it was 5,000, it was 5,000 to 50,000. Huge difference. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto thee, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman, and he said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is given, forgiven, the same loveth little. And he saith unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that were eating with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Father, I thank you for your word, and I pray that you will speak to our hearts out of this passage of Scripture in a powerful way today. We ask for the moving of your Holy Spirit in our midst. May you be truly glorified and lifted up this day, Lord Jesus. And if there's one under the sound of my voice that's never come to know you, and you, the, your power to forgive sins... I pray that this day would be their day of salvation. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. The story of Jesus' anointing at Bethany uh, near the end of his ministry is recorded in Matthew and Mark and John, Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John 12. And in those three settings at Bethany, Jesus is anointed with expensive perfume and he is also anointed by a woman. And John chapter 12, verse 3, identifies her as Mary, the uh, sister to Lazarus. And then uh, also, it tells us in Mark and in Matthew's account that it was in the house of Simon the leper that this took place. It also tells us in those uh, other passages in Matthew, Mark, and John that he was anointed upon his head. His head was anointed. And uh, I think that's in Matthew and in Mark's account. I believe that Luke 7, and not everyone agrees with me, but I wholeheartedly believe that Luke 7 is a totally different account. I believe it happens earlier in the ministry of Jesus and not toward the end at Bethany. I believe we're in a different region uh, of the country in Luke 7. And uh, I, it, it tells us that it's not Simon the leper but rather Simon the Pharisee that invited him. And if we, if we would 
kind of skip back a chapter, we could see that the Pharisees were always trying to entrap Jesus. And I got an idea that Simon invited him to his house for that purpose, based on what we learned earlier. In, in Luke 6, 7, just to give you an idea, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. They were always looking to get Jesus on something. And so he invited Jesus to the dinner party, uh, I, I think for an ulterior motive. The woman in Luke 7 is nameless. But uh, if she has a name, I, I think it must be Mary. And I don't, guess we'll find out in eternity if we care to know when we get there. But I think it might be Mary Magdalene. Uh, Mary Magdalene, if you didn't know, she was the last at the cross. She was the first at the tomb. She was the first to bring the resurrection report. He's alive. I've seen him. He's alive. The Bible tells us that out of whom was cast seven devils. Uh, Mary Magdalene had a tainted past. And the woman of Luke 7 has a tainted past. She was known as a sinful woman, an immoral woman. And I believe that Mary Magdalene really fits the bill. We don't know for sure, but if it was a Mary, I would choose to believe Mary Magdalene rather than Mary the sister of Lazarus. And again, I don't know if it's good for us to speculate or not, but uh, that's my thoughts. Worship, and this is a beautiful passage on worship and true worship. Uh, is the proper response to the presence of God. The sincerity of our worship is determined by the degree which we believe that God is here or listening or aware of us or what He's done for us. If you really believe that He's here and you really believe that He saved you, if you really believe that you're headed toward the Father's house, toward His house forever and ever. Your worship would be more heartfelt and more exuberant. If you really believe He was listening and watching, we would worship at a higher level, at a deeper level. The Scripture gives us this beautiful picture of true worship. It's an amazing response of love and devotion, and it happened at the feet of Jesus. Here's a heartbroken woman before the Lord, her tears flowing over His feet. She anoints His feet in the process with this costly perfume. It has wonderful fragrance. It represents her very best. Poured upon Jesus. Lavished upon Jesus. It represents really all that's left of her life that was beautiful. And she pours it out on him. She no doubt had saved that alabaster box for a special occasion. And this was it. There would be no more special occasion for her than being at the feet of Jesus. The Bible gives us this snapshot of true worship. It reveals quite a bit to us uh, about the woman, which we'll talk about. But it also shows us a lot about Jesus. And I pray that you will pay attention to the Word of God and its revelation of Jesus. It's important that we get a good picture of Jesus. And I believe the Word of God gives us a good picture of Jesus. This picture of true worship happens at a dinner party. And it happens at the feet of Jesus. And it was an amazing outpouring of love and devotion. Worship is not always without words. But in this instance, it was. It was wordless worship. And it couldn't have been more of a true worship as she was there at the feet of Jesus. Jesus I think would pose the same question to us today that he did to Simon. He said, do you see this woman? He said, seest thou this woman in Luke 7, 44? Do you see her? 
Do you see her? Are your eyes open to see this woman? And I believe it's important for us to open our eyes and take a good look at this woman today. We don't know her name. We speculate, but we don't know her name. I think Jesus knew it. Be sure she had one. And Jesus knew it. We do know that she was a sinner. That was her reputation. She was identified as a sinner. And we also know that she is responsible for one of the most beautiful acts of worship of all time. We know that she came into the presence of Jesus with a gift. Her very best. Many only still come into the presence of Jesus to receive or to hope to receive, but she came to give. Perhaps her most precious treasure, I don't think there's any doubt about that, maybe the very best she had, again, I don't think there's any doubt about that. She didn't offer the common. This gift was no doubt quite valuable. It was expensive and it was a sacrifice of worship. In Malachi 1 and verses 6 through 8, it tells us how people came to worship and what they gave to God was what they didn't want themselves. They gave unwanted and diseased animals to the Lord and, the God, and God saw their disrespect and dishonor that they showed Him. Jesus was very much aware of the sacrifice this woman was bestowing upon Him that day. We know she wept. There's some things we don't know, but there's some things we do know. We don't know her name. Uh, we do know she was a worshiper. We know that she came with a gift. We know she wept. And tears are part of releasing high-level emotion. And I look over the congregation today and I see some people that have had hearts recently broken. And sometimes it's hard to get through a day without tears, isn't it? Tears are part of releasing high-level emotion. I went, we went down to my old hometown, Orleans, last night. Ended up having uh, some pizza in the park with uh, the two youngest grandchildren. And then uh, my oldest son's boys came in with a girlfriend. So we were in the park. My hometown, I said, I was telling them, I said, where I went to the first grade, I was showing them where the building used to be that's not there anymore and told them where we lived up across the tracks and just kind of reminiscing also my mind went to when my little brother was still alive and I thought about that and and uh, I remember 37 years ago and uh, holding on to his lifeless body and I couldn't hold back the tears I thought my heart would break Sometimes you feel like your heart's going to explode on the inside of you and you don't think you're going to get another breath when you're just overwhelmed by emotion. This woman was very emotional at the feet of Jesus. She didn't bring supplies to care for His feet, but she had tears. And those tears were enough to wash His feet. She just comes in suddenly. She's not invited. She's not on the guest list. She was a sinner. She was immoral. She was regarded by the religious with disgust. Did you notice that? What kind of woman? If he were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman. You know, that kind of a woman. That's what she got called. She always, you know, was experiencing the stares and, the, and she hears the whispers and she always is meeting with everyone's overwhelming disapproval. And you've got to admire this woman. She's got great courage. She comes to Jesus. Somehow she gets past her critics and scorners. It's hard to get past them sometimes. Sometimes we'd just rather avoid them. But she somehow gets past her critics and scorners. And she gets past her own past and her own sinful past, her own immoral past. And she comes right to the feet of Jesus. Couldn't be a better place for her than at the feet of Jesus. You see, Jesus had changed her life forever. She had found real forgiveness, true acceptance. There was change, glorious change, transformation, radical change. Her heart had been changed. 
she'd come to a place of brokenness in her life. And I believe brokenness can be introduced by different means. But the Holy Spirit is able to break us into the realm of brokenness. The harsh realities of life and death can also come crashing down upon us, leaving us, like me, gasping for emotional breath. Like Jerry Rowe, getting word about his son. Oh, my heart goes out to him. We know this woman was broken. The proof is in her humility and in her tears. Like Linda Pearson, I think I saw her somewhere today. I guess maybe I didn't. I thought I saw her earlier. But I think about her often. Genuine worship requires brokenness. Sometimes we uh, construct a protective wall around our heart so as to insulate ourselves from further hurt in life. So we become more like the alabaster box than the ointment or the perfume within. We have a rock hard attitude and it prohibits the expression of worship. If you're hard-hearted, you're not going to be a worshiper. Alabaster is a white, marble-like mineral. And unfortunately, we're sometimes more like the box. If we're contained and encased and the contents undisclosed, there's no worship, no worshipful fragrance emitting. We may look good. In fact, we may appear to be quite beautiful if you're only concerned about what's on the outside, but God's more concerned about what's on the inside. The church should not be just row after row of cold, beautiful vases. If we have Jesus on the inside, if we have the treasure, this treasure in our earthen vessels, then our need is to be broken and poured out, and we must put away the cold alabaster front. In Mark 12, 30, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Is that your heart today? We know this woman did just that. She was broken over her life of sin. She comes to Jesus. She withholds, withholds nothing. All is surrendered. At His feet she bows. She washes those feet with her tears, and those were no ordinary feet. These were the feet of the King. These were the feet of the Son of God. These were God's feet, God in the flesh. And she pours her gift of ointment. She loved Him with all she had, just like the Scripture commands. She held nothing back. And in the process of the worshipful experience, Simon imagines in his own mind if he were a true prophet, if he was really a genuine prophet, I mean if he was the real thing, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. You know, the self-righteous Pharisee, he says if Jesus knew. Self-righteous people always think they know. You ever run into any? Oh, they know it all. They know something nobody else knows. What he didn't know was that she already was forgiven and she was already saved. She didn't come to Jesus and do that that she might be forgiven. She came and did that because she was forgiven. We don't get forgiveness because we love we love because we've been forgiven. She comes with our brokenness and tears. She comes with repentance, I believe. Truly sorry for the life she's lived. She releases these high-level emotions as she weeps over her sin-filled past. And somehow she knows she's in the right place with the right man for the first time in her life. Her confidence and trust in Jesus is 
not met with his disapproval, by the way. He doesn't recoil or push back. He has no words of chastisement or rebuke for this broken-hearted woman. He seems neither alarmed or embarrassed by her actions. But others that were watching, they couldn't believe Jesus would let a woman like her touch him. Can you imagine? The proud, the self-righteous, they never see the weight, they never feel the weight of their own sins. They see no need for forgiveness. Well, what have I done? I've not done anything wrong. There's no sense of guilt. But the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And pride just might be the worst of sins. It seems to be so connected to every other. The woman felt the extreme weight of her sin bearing down on her. You know, some people are looked up to. She was looked down on. Her reputation was tarnished. She was a sinner, probably a prostitute. We don't know that for sure, but most likely. And the party's going on at Simon's house. Simon invites Jesus, but he extends no common courtesies to welcome him, which kind of makes me think back to the Luke 6 scripture. He's looking only to entrap Jesus, try to find something on him. He offers no water for his feet. These are just general courtesies extended to guests. He offers no kiss. He offers no oil for his head. But this uninvited guest does everything Simon didn't. And people's opinions didn't stop her. You've got to get past the people. It's not about the people and their opinion. It's all about you and Jesus. The only reason she's in the house was Jesus. Watch her. Watch her move to His feet. She took a place of humility at His feet. She has no water, but she has tears. She has no towel, but she's got her hair. Both are used to wash the Master's feet. And then she opens up that bottle of perfume. And maybe it's her only possession of worth. And she pours it out upon Jesus. And it indeed was an extravagant display. Her open display of worship toward Jesus results, I think, from that most recent discovery in her life. She had found the love of God in Jesus Christ. We don't know exactly when and we don't know exactly how, but we know all about the who. It was Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, this woman had received the love of God. She was thirsty for a change in her life. She knew about guilt. She knew about regret. She knew about the many nights. Never finding what truly satisfied. Thirsty for love. Somehow, one day, Jesus offers her a drink of the waters of salvation and she doesn't simply sip or have a meager taste. She drinks deeply of God's grace and mercy and she finds His forgiveness and favor. She received God's love and God's love changed her life and God's love will change your life as well. God's love is the answer. It's the answer that we all need. Jesus said, do you see her? Do you see this woman? And he didn't really. When he looked at her, all he saw was a sinful woman. He saw her past. But when Jesus looks at you, he just doesn't see your past. He knows your past. But he sees what you can be. He sees your future. This woman's wonderful display of worship. Weeping, washing, drying, kissing, anointing. Oh, by the way, Jesus indicated the kissing, it just never stopped. 
It just never stopped. He said, she's never stopped kissing my feet. It was by, before you jump to conclusions, it was simply a sign of the most deepest reverence and respect. It was done with humility and love, all done with gratitude and faith, sincerity and devotion. It was the deepest respect for her Savior and Lord. Jesus had set her free from a life of sin and shame. And she could now rejoice in knowing forgiveness and eternal life. She was saved. Forgiveness is always the heartbeat of Jesus. If, you're, if you feel unforgiven today, if you feel the weight of your guilt, I tell you, Jesus stands ready to bring forgiveness to your life today. And it's the greatest of miracles. There's no greater miracle than be, being forgiven of your sins. It's God's gift to you and can be received by faith. Remember he said, thy faith, thy faith has saved thee. That's what he said in verse 50. He said, go in peace. Go in shalom. In that, that all-encompassing word of God's goodness. Peace. The peace of God. The wholeness of God. Faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. I urge you to trust Him today. Jesus released her to go in peace. That was a new realm in which to walk and live. She would begin to live in a new atmosphere. She would breathe new air and enjoy brand new life. And it was both peaceful and powerful, I assure you. Four life-changing words we all need to hear. Thy sins are forgiven. How many of you have been glad to hear those words? Thy sins are forgiven. He gave her four words. Thy sins are forgiven. Luke 7, 48. He speaks to her. It's personal. And he said, your sins, they're all forgiven. Whatever you've done wrong, everything you've done wrong, all forgiven. It's over. What a great word, forgiven. Sins canceled, pardoned, released, and set free. And, it all, and that makes a relationship with God possible. And they said, and they muttered, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus and there's forgiveness in no other name but in the name of Jesus. She released her gratefulness. If you've been a little lax in your worship and you haven't been grateful because of all the things that are happening in the earth and I know it's been a traumatic, upsetting time, you don't want to lose sight of the fact that God deserves to be worshipped. And He's looking in the earth for those that will worship Him. Worship Him. And the church should be filling the earth with the fragrance of worship. Somebody said, well, the world stinks. There's a stench to the world. And we ought to be changing that a little bit. Worship can be fragrant. Let's fill the earth with our worship to the Lord. Long before we loved Him, long before we thought of giving Him anything, He gave to us. He gave to us. He broke open His treasure. He poured out for us what was precious to Him. God sent His Son. God gave us His very best. He gave us His Son. If you didn't hear me, God gave us His Son, His only begotten Son. He gave Him, and Jesus gave Himself. He was a sacrifice for our sins. And he poured out the greatest of treasures. And it, was, it wasn't something out of a bottle, but it was something out of his body. And it was the blood. He poured out his blood on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. The precious blood of Jesus. Not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. But with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That fountain still filled with blood that was drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood. Lose all. Lose all their guilty stains. You know what it is to have your guilty stains washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, Jeff, what is worship in spirit and in truth? What is worship? I think there's a great picture of it right here. This is worship that, that is acceptable in the sight of God. It's a correct response to the presence of God. It's human response to the perceived presence of the divine. Have you ever sensed the presence of God? 
What's your heartfelt response to the Savior? I pray God will give you recognition of His presence. And I pray that you can focus your attention and you won't be distracted away, but you will focus your attention on Him. It was like she was in the room with Jesus and nobody else was there. And she released her worship. Your worship may have words. You may have words that you'd like to bestow upon the Lord, and that's fine. Your gratefulness may be wordy. It's okay. Use your vocabulary to the nth degree. But give Him worship. Make sure it's coming from your heart. Make sure it's sincere, heartfelt, and reverent. There are biblical examples of true worship. And this wordless example of worship has got to be right at the top of the list. It's so intense. But I'll tell you, in order to worship, you've got to do a couple things. First one is you've got to get where Jesus is. And you've got to overcome whatever obstacles it is, but get into His presence. You can do that right here, right now. You can do it at home. There's a lot of places you can come into the presence of the Lord, but God invites us to come. Come. Come as a worshiper. Now is the time to worship and get at His feet. Get at His feet and be done with your pride. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will introduce a new brokenness and humility and a spirit of repentance in your heart. Worship at His feet. I was preparing the last few days for this and we are looking forward to sharing it with you and it was early early this morning I had this thought and I put it in my final notes if you have any question about where and why you should bow your knee this should answer it you should bow your knee at the feet of Jesus you should bow your knee before Jesus and I'm not sure about anywhere else But if you have any question about where and why, you should bow your knee. Make sure you bow your knee at the feet of Jesus. She released her gift. What have you released upon the Lord lately? What are your worship worship excuses? What's your excuses for not worshiping? You know, they're, they're all illegitimate. There's no good reason why we shouldn't be worshipers. She brought her best. She brought something precious. The fragrance of worship. We've got to get over this thing about being more concerned about what we're going to get out of it instead of what we can give to Him. If He never done one more thing for me, how could I not praise Him throughout all of eternity? Let's not be so concerned about receiving as giving Him what He is due. And she worshipped and she gave her best. And she's such an example. And we will find her in eternity. And if we want to know then, we'll find out her name. But what a beautiful act of worship. I pray that you'll be found kneeling at the feet of Jesus giving Him your very best. Let's give Him our very best. Let's close today with just giving Him our very best with an ovation. Let's give the Lord Jesus Christ a standing ovation here in God's house today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless His name. We love You, Lord. We love You, Lord. We pour our love and worship on You. You alone are worthy to receive our praise. Holy are You. Besides You, there is none else. We worship You. We worship You. You are worthy to receive our praise. Hallelujah. Glory to His name. Father, I pray You'll bless these people. I pray, Lord, that You will just make Yourself known continuing to reveal Yourself in the earth. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the revelation of Yourself through Your precious Word. Thank You for revealing Yourself to us from Your precious Word. We give You praise for that. 
in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen.